Good morning and happy Sabbath, Church. We are the Vancouver Rangers, and today we will be leading out in Sabbath school. Please join us in singing our first song, Reckless Love. Thank you. 
next song is Good Good Father.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath you've given us. We honor and praise you because you're the most powerful of all. I ask you, Lord, to protect us with your wings from this pandemic and may keep us all healthy and strong. I also pray for the students who are going back to school. May you bless them and protect them. I pray that all things will get back to normal so we can praise you the way you taught us. Thank you for the blessings you've given us all and may you forgive our sins we committed unto you. That is all I ask for in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Church. I'm so happy that we could all gather today to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, the main theme for our Sabbath school service is called Spiritual Gifts, which is going to be led by the Rangers Pathfinder Group. Happy Sabbath again, brothers and sisters. I would like to thank all the participants who have already done their part, the praise team, which was led by the Rangers, and the opening prayer, which was led by Sean Marquez. Moving on, we have a special music, which will be delivered up to us by Kyra Bug Ayan, and we will also have a special feature following that, which will be led by the Rangers. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Romans 12, 6 to 8. It says, Having then gifts differ differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophesy, let us prophesy. If prophecy, let us prophesy. In proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with libera liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. I hope that verse inspires us. And I also, we hope that each one of us will have a spirit-filled Sabbath. And I pray that we will all be blessed as we worship and honor You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet me fail, and there I find you in the mystery of oceans deep, my faith will stand, and I rise my soul will rest in your embrace for i am yours and you are mine your grace abounds in deep waters sovereign hand will be my guide where feet may fear and fear surrounds me you've never failed and you won't start now so I rise my soul will rest in your embrace for i am yours and you are mine This way. 
without borders and we walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my savior so i will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for i am yours you are mine Happy Sabbath Church We are delighted to welcome you to our virtual Sabbath School program We are the Vancouver Rangers and we are blessed to be leading out the Sabbath service this morning we will be talking about spiritual gifts this morning. Esther, Esther and I are so excited to be seeing our fellow Pathfinders in person. We haven't seen each other for a long time, but I can praise God that, that, in, that through the Sabbath School program, we can hang out again. Don't worry, Church. We are doing this safely by maintaining our distance and by wearing our masks. Okay, let's start. Oh, hi there, Chibella, dear. Hello. I have a very interesting question for the both of you. Can you name your spiritual gifts? Well, I think my spiritual gift is my willingness to serve and volunteer whenever and when, wherever I can. And I guess my spiritual gift is sharing God's word through music. Very good. Okay. Hey guys, it's so nice to see you all in person again. Hi. So I have a question for the three of you. Can you see the connection between how God has gifted you and how you can influence your world? Can you answer please? Well, I've always liked music, so I like play the violin. And how I influence my world is that at church I play like Christian music and stuff. So, and like at recitals I do that too. Wow. Crystal? I usually play gifts to influence the people around you. Let's start off with Joshua. Okay. Well, my spiritual gift is leadership skills. And by using my leadership skill, I can influence the people around me in school as we work as a, part. a project at school. Sure, my classmates can do that as well. But it says in Proverbs 29 11, paraphrasing, a fool man does his own thing, but a wise man takes care of that. So by using that, I can influence people around me. Thank you, Joshua. How about you, Bea? My spiritual gift is being friendly, and what I can do to help my classmates is when they're sad, I can help them up and make them happy again. Thank you. How about you, Sophia? I think my spiritual gift is being positive, and I can help my classmates uh, by spreading positivity around the classroom. Thank you guys for your answer. And the last but certainly not least, we have Lydia and Nathan. Thanks for coming to answer this question here. So, share an experience where you used or shared your spiritual gifts. First, in Ephesians 4 verse 7, Christ has generously divided to His or God's gift to us. And I consider to know that I practice play Christian songs through piano like I practice a few times for now and every time I play piano I play different since I participated in few days 
and it impaired my different Christian songs for in different subjects for every time. So I share with each artist they like my old songs and new songs what they like. Last year at BBS 2019, it was at church, and I was assigned as a group leader taking care of many kids. So after a long day of activities, playing around, playing outside, our last activity, our, our closing, was to go on stage, and all the little kids would go on stage and sing the theme songs and all the songs for BBS. Um, as I was looking around, taking care of my group, I realized that there was one little boy who was all by himself and he looked alone and upset. So using my spiritual gift of empathy, I went up to him because I, I felt how he would feel and I talked to him, I played with him, you know, I made jokes and I convinced him to go up stage and sing with his friends. Wow, thank you so much for sharing your experiences, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Bye. There you go, church. You have heard your Pathfinders talk about their spiritual gifts. We are so thankful that we have our families, our church family, who helps us nurture these spiritual gifts that God has bestowed to each of us. Please continue to pray for your Pathfinders so that we can continue to be a blessing to the people around us. It's a pleasure, pleasure to do this interview with you, Esther. Me too. I am truly happy and grateful that we are able to do this and share our gifts to our church family. Happy Sabbath, everyone. And this is Esther. And Danielle. And the Rangers. Rangers. Signing out. Good morning! Happy Sabbath everyone! Praise God for another week of God's loving kindness, guidance, and leading to us. Welcome to Sabbath School Study Hour. Our lesson for this week, Ministering Like Jesus, highlighted in the memory gem found in Matthew 9, 36, and I read, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. The Lord Jesus' loving ministry of compassion in his life on earth revealed that he genuinely cared for people and he was more interested in their concerns and needs rather than his own. It showed that Christ's life was totally other-centered and he lived a selfless life. Jesus cared for the physical, mental, as well as emotional needs of the people around him, and consequently, hearts became open to the spiritual lessons that he thought. As Jesus helped lepers open the blind eyes, unstopped the deaf ears, delivered demoniacs, he also fed the hungry, and cared for the needy, hearts were touched and lives were changed. And according to the servant of the Lord, Mrs. Ellen G. White, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the hearts of the people. The, the Savior mingled with the people, desiring their good. He showed his sympathy to them, and he ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. Jesus recognized that the world needed a live demonstration of the gospel being preached. In short, the world needs a living sermon. The living witness of a Christ-like life committed to ministering to others is a powerful testimony to the words we speak and gives credibility to our witness. Today, our panel of teachers composed of Sid Amancio presenting Sunday's lesson, Jesus' Attitude Toward People. Jesse Nukasa presenting Monday's lesson, Jesus' Treatment of People. Angie Berto presenting Tuesday's lesson, Jesus' Healing Ministry Part 1. And Ben Berto presenting Wednesday's lesson, Jesus' Healing Ministry Part 2. Then Pastor Lomar and Shaila Makaraig will present Thursday lesson, What Matters to Jesus and then he will give the summary. There will also be questions along 
the daily lesson discussion. The lesson study will then be closed by prayer by Katrina Hinebla. So as we focus on this lesson, may the Holy Spirit help us effectively make friends for Jesus and reflect nobly the immeasurable love of God. But before I give the time to the teachers in the sequence I mentioned, let us invite the Holy Spirit to lead us in our study. Let's pray. Our kind, merciful God and loving Father in heaven, please forgive us all our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and be with us in our study. We invite the Holy Presence of the Holy Spirit in our study to lead us and um, give us the grace as we implement all these lessons in our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Church. I earnestly pray that every one of you are well and safe. We praise and thank God for this time that we can again study His Word. So let's dive right in to our lesson. We are now in lesson number eight, Ministering Like Jesus. And in our Sunday topic, it is entitled, Jesus' Attitude Toward People. During Jesus' short years of ministry, Many people open their hearts to the spiritual truth or the demonstration of the gospel that Jesus taught them. The reasons of which are because Jesus cares so much for them. His caring of them was genuine and authentic. He was interested in their needs and concerns, whether it be physical, emotional, and mental needs. What are those needs? We can find it in Matthew chapter 9 verses 27 to 38 where Jesus healed two blind men. He also made a mute and demon-possessed man speak again. It is also in these verses that uh, he was moved with compassion seeing a multitude coming to him where he described them as lost sheep without a shepherd. He showed his sympathy for them, met their needs, and gave them confidence. Through this, he invited them and said, Come, follow me. Jesus really thinks and feels about people. This is his attitude towards them. He always looked for the good in them. These are Christ's method or way of reaching people. There might be other ways, but Christ's method alone, no other, will give true success in reaching people. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, tells us about the parable of the lost sheep wherein the religious leaders criticize Jesus that he receives sinners and eats with them meaning Jesus fellowships or associates with the ungodly the scribes the Pharisees the Sadducees view of religion was one of separation and not participation they avoid or keep away from the people that are outside of, of their religion, thinking that they were contaminated with sin. But in Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, Jesus surprised them when he said of himself these words. Matthew chapter 9 verse 13 says, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus' interest is to seek and save the lost. 
and not the righteous. Though sinless, Jesus went down from heaven to redeem the world and not to avoid it, thus offering us the free gift of salvation. Jesus used two metaphors to describe his followers then and us, his followers now, at the present. <clears throat> Jesus gave an account in words how to attract people to the gospel through their actions which will become bright and shining with God's blessings. Matthew 5 verse 13 Jesus said to his followers, You are the salt of the earth. Of all the substances on earth available that time, why salt? Why not the pearl of the earth, the gold of the earth, things like that. In the ancient world, salt was one of the most important resources. Other than being used as preservatives and flavor for food, it was also being used as money. Talking about something that will spike a person's interest. It was a symbol of wealth and power during those times. But for Jesus, salt is to symbolize them as true wealth of the world by being committed Christians who are making a difference for the kingdom of God. Jesus wants us to have a loving act of unselfish service to the people of God. He wants us to preserve the goodness and flavor of the atmosphere, meaning protect society against moral and spiritual decay. He also wants us to do what Christ always does, respond with grace, even when the circumstances are challenging. What are the examples of responding with grace? Use kind and gentle words and not hateful and mean-spirited ones. Smile and always show love with your presence to others. Always forgive. Learn to say I'm sorry. Always say thank you. And show interest to others. This way, the spread of evil is prevented. And in verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. What does light do? It shines in darkness. Darkness represents absence of light. But in the Bible, darkness represents wickedness and evil. Light penetrates darkness, making the darkness light. That means Jesus wants us to look for the good of people around us. Let them know we appreciate them. Every day we meet people with different needs. Jesus wants to fulfill those needs through us. To shine, not to bring attention to ourselves but to act as a beacon of light, pointing people toward Him, living in a way that reflects Jesus' values. Humanity's ultimate need is to have a personal relationship with God. It's the only way we're in we will realize that we are just strangers in this fallen world, longing for a home that is in heaven, isn't it? We risk eternal salvation if we neglect these deeds of bringing people to God. Unselfish service through Jesus opens hearts and breaks down fear or hatred towards others. Jesus was not a mere spectacular miracle worker. He was the divine 
Son of God, who came on a mission to give us life eternal. Therefore, as God's followers, let's go out there and make a difference for other people's lives for eternity. May God bless us all. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Let us answer the question for our Sunday lesson. After considering Jesus' words in John chapter 17, verses 15 to 18, how are we to understand the idea of separation from the world and avoidance of the world? Are they the same thing? What did Jesus mean when he prayed that his followers would be in the world but not of the world? How do we do that? The Lord's Prayer in John 17, 8, 15 to 18 show us that God wants us to live a normal human life on this earth but not being controlled by Satan's system. He wants us to live for him and to shine as testimonies to the world concerning him. The world is Satan's system that uses every legitimate necessities to capture our hearts and consume our time. We may need these things that the world makes us want more than we really need. It takes our energy and occupy our thoughts so that we have less time for God. When anything, even what we consider a good thing, takes over our lives and causes us to be for something other than the Lord, we have to realize it has become the world to us. So the question isn't, is this thing good or bad? The question is, does this thing hinder my relationship with the Lord? Whatever it is, if it's something that hinders us from living for God and His purpose, it's the world. So what should we do? All involve prayer and fellowship with the Lord. We can't save ourselves. We need to be saved. We need to pray and let the Lord shine on us. Our own energy and good intentions cannot deliver us from the power of the world. We need the energy of the divine life that comes from our partaking of the divine nature of God. It is crucial for us to spend time with God each day to fellowship with Him and be fed by Him in His Word and in prayer. The more we love Him, the more will be delivered from the world and its allure. And that answers our question and uh, we'll proceed to our uh, next lesson. Thank you. This week's lesson 8 is entitled Ministering Like Jesus. Subtitle on Monday, Jesus' Treatment of People. What is the focus of Jesus in treating people? Jesus' goal was to bring out the best in people, even when the circumstances were unusually challenging. He responded with grace. In Luke Gospel, records that the crowds marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out in his mouth, found in Luke 4, verse 22. How about in John's Gospel? Adds that the grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. His approach to people was disarming. His gracious words touched a responsive chord in their hearts. Like what happened when our first parents sinned against God? When they disobeyed His commandment, even though they transgressed, God didn't let them live without hope. He immediately laid out the plan of redemption to His creation. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God said, He put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, 
and thou shalt bruise his heel. That plan was laid out immediately after Adam and Eve sin against God. Likewise, how he treated the righteous and the sinners. Likewise, the just and the unjust. Read Matthew 5, verse 45. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and in the good, and shineth, sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust, and advise, and advise you and me, in uh, verse 44, it says, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Question. What hope filled words did Jesus speak to the centurion in Matthew 8 verses 5 to 10? Or also you can read also in, Matthew, in Luke 5, 7 verse 1 to 10. But we will take a look on Matthew 8 verses 5 to 10 as an example. In verse 5, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, as, you, as all we know, Capernaum is located in the, in the Galilee region on the northern Israel. There came into him a centurion, besetting, besetting mean asking him or somebody urgently or fervently to do something. So maybe something wrong in the household of the centurion that he went to Jesus to see him. But before that, a centurion, to clarify, a centurion is a Roman soldier or a commanding officer. He has in command about eight or one hundred soldiers. Century mean one hundred. He is, also, he is also a Gentile or a non-believer. In verse 6, he went to see the Lord to plea and explain what is happening in his household. And he said, Lord, my servant dieth at home, sick of the palsy and grievously tormented. But if we go to Luke 7 verse 2, the centurion's servant said, Who was dear to, unto him was sick and ready to die. So meaning to say, one, one of, the, of his servant in their house was sick and any time he will die. But Jesus answered in verse 7. He said, I will come and heal him as the centurion requests to Jesus to come in his house to heal his servant. But in verse 8, the centurion changed his mind and he said, The centurion answered, said, Lord, I am not worthy that you will come under my roof or that you will come in, a, in our house. What is the reason? Maybe the reason is one, being Jesus was a, a Jew and he is a Gentile. Their culture during that time, the Gentile is not allowed to meet or mingle with the Jew or the vice versa. Or else 
the Jew will be defiled because of mingling to other race or particularly the uh, Gentile people. But the centurion explained himself. Being a centurion, he said in verse 9, He said, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to, to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he do it. But in verse 8, The centurion believed on Jesus that as the centurion is be, uh, uh, being as a uh, commanding officer, he has power. But the centurion believed that Jesus has more powerful or uh, he has the power to heal those sick people. That's why the centurion believed that he requested Jesus that he said, just speak the word only and my servant will be healed. What a faith ha has the centurion to Jesus that Jesus has the power to heal. Through his word, he can heal his servant. In verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that, follow, that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So Jesus was so amazed with the centurion by his faith that he said, Only a word from you, Lord, will heal my servant. In closing, when our words are encouraging and filled with grace, they have a positive influence on the lives of others. Isaiah's prophetic word revealed that Jesus would not break a bruised reed or quench a smoking flax. In other words, Jesus was so compassionate that he was careful not to bruise unnecessary someone who was just coming to faith or to quench the slightest embers of faith in their hearts. I think, brothers and sisters, we should have faith in Jesus like the centurion. Jesus can do everything when we come to him to tell him our burdens, our problems in our household, and especially today that uh, we are facing this pandemic. We should have faith in Jesus that Jesus will end this tragic pandemic in this world before he will come in the second time. Thank you for... Uh, being with me in the discussion, simple discussion on Monday's lesson, entitled uh, Jesus' Treatment of People. Thank you. Jesus' Healing Ministry The ministry of Jesus was radical and unconventional. The religious leaders memorized what was in their textbooks. That was why the clergy and teachers hated Jesus, because he was attracting more followers than they. Jesus never gave a memorized speech. 
he quoted directly from the scriptures. He rubbed shoulders with people who have all kinds of needs, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Christ is eager to meet those needs through us as we show concerns for people's loneliness, sorrow, and heartache, and as we show an interest in their joys, hopes, and dreams. Now, what are the needs that Jesus ministered to? The needs? There are two needs, felt needs and ultimate needs. Felt needs are those areas in our lives in which we sense that we cannot solve an issue by ourselves. They could be a need to quit smoking, drinking, reducing weight, getting on a better diet, or reducing stress. It may be a need for food, housing, or medical care. One example is when our church does the feeding the homeless. It may be the need for counseling for the marriage or family. The second need are the ultimate needs. These are what human beings need most. The need for a personal relationship with God and the realization that their life has eternal significance. Reconciliation with God in a broken world is our ultimate need. Do you remember the time that Jesus fed the 5,000 people and the 4,000? What is that? That is uh, feeling the... That is just a question to the audience. Do you remember that story? Now, in the stories of the paralytic, in Matthew 9, 1 to 7, and the woman with the issue of blood, in Mark 5, 25 to 34, what indications that Jesus linked physical healing with meeting the ultimate need for reconciliation with God? Before we can answer that, we need to read first Matthew 9, 1 to 7. So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once, some of the scribes said, within themselves this man blasphemes but Jesus knowing their thoughts said why do you think evil in your hearts for which is easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say arise and walk but that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins he said to the paralytic arise take up your bed and go to your house and he arose and departed to his house. What is the other one? Uh, Mark 5, 25, Mark 5, 25 to 34? Yes. Okay, so this is the story of Mark, the woman with the issue of blood. Mark 5, 25 to 34? 25 to 34. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well immediately. The fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see, the multitude drawn in you, and you say, Who touched me? And 
He looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Jesus appreciated the woman's faith and declared it to the people. No, he said, this healing made the woman strong in her belief in Jesus. Jesus. Jesus put himself in her way so she could have the opportunity to exercise her faith. He was going to heal the nobleman's and the Jairus daughter and that woman said if I will just touch the hem of his garment I will be made whole. That is strong faith in Jesus. Okay, for Christ, physical healing without spiritual healing was incomplete. The paralytic was tormented by his physical condition when he attributed to his sins. Jesus' pronouncement of the forgiving of his sins healed his spiritual sickness first before healing him physically. If God's love motivates us to desire an individual's physical and emotional well-being, it also will motivate us much more to desire that person's spiritual well-being so that he or she can live life to the fullest here and through all eternity. Amen to that. After all, every person whom Jesus healed eventually died. Hence, their real need above everything else was spiritual, was it not? Yes, it was. And um, Jesus' healing ministry. When Jesus started his ministry, he was 30 years old. He did not do what the recognized teachers did in his day. He started in Galilee instead of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the metropolis. The teachers went about in beautiful uniforms. They enjoyed being called rabbis and went only with the rich, the educated, and influential people. They ignored the poor, the tax collectors, the farmers, the fishermen, and the sex trade workers. These are the people that Jesus associated with. Although he did not ignore the upper class, remember he accepted the invitation of one Pharisee for dinner. By the way, what attracted people to Jesus? What three methods did Jesus use effectively? In his uh, ministry, Jesus used three methods, which was teaching, preaching, and healing. And we find that teaching came first. The Sermon on the Mount was a profound teaching. It was one that upset all the thinking of the people. The longest recorded talk fest of Jesus in the Gospels. It clarified many of the misconceptions of the people in its day and today and he magnified the law and made it honorable. He did not go away with the law. Uh, what did the people say about his teaching? The people were surprised. They said, how did this carpenter 
who was the son of a carpenter, get his method. The people are made because he taught them with authority, not like the scribes. <coughs> you know, the scribes, they taught man-made regulations about the truth and not the truth itself. Mm -hmm. They had endless discussions and made rules on how to keep the Sabbath, which made it harder to keep the Sabbath. One example, they would not eat an egg laid on the Sabbath because the chicken did not keep the Sabbath. <laughs> Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. I didn't see any chicken there. Next method he did was preaching. Have you ever seen a recorded sermon of Jesus? Mm. But he preached in every city, in Galilee, in Dedicapolis, and Jerusalem, and Samaria. He told his disciples that the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more workers. That means you and me, and you, and you, and you. The last method was healing. It was a more attractive way of winning the people. It was healing. If there was a more active, attractive way of winning the people, it was healing. And everyone was made well after Jesus went through the town. Um, in Any Mark, in Mark 1, 32-39, we find that after healing all the sick people till late at night, a great while before dawn, Jesus went to the mountain to pray. After praying, his disciples said a lot of people wanted to see him. Why did Jesus leave the crowd of people who wanted to see him? What did he say? No. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 19.10, he clearly stated his purpose there in coming to this earth. He said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Those people have been with him for a long time. They were hearing him every day, but he had to go to the other cities. He said he came to preach the gospel not merely as some spectacular miracle worker. Oh yeah, he did many, 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 many miracles. But his purpose was to teach to preach the kingdom of God. He was the divine son, after all, who came on a redemptive mission for you and for me and for everyone. So its act of healing was an opportunity for Jesus to reveal his character, to relieve suffering and provide an opportunity for eternal life. So, to restate, Christ's method alone, you are familiar with this, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with man as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. 
Another question? Um, I have a question for, for your church. For our church. <laughs> and our church to ponder upon. What practical ways can our church lead people to spiritual truths when we minister to their physical and emotional needs? I repeat, what practical ways can our church lead people to spiritual truths when we minister to their physical and emotional needs? Thank you very much. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My task today is to uh, discuss uh, with you, or to you, a uh, Thursday lesson, uh, which is entitled, What Matters to Jesus? Our lesson here in Thursday mentioned uh, three parables, okay? And uh, let's take a look at these parables. Uh, one is about the parable of the ten virgins, okay, in Matthew 25. Um, this parable emphasizes the importance of a genuine, authentic, spirit-filled life. That is the focus of that parable. The parable of the ten talents underlines the... Uh, importance of faithfully using the gifts that God has given to each one of us. And then, the parable of the sheep and goats reveals that genuine Christianity truly ministers to the needs of those God brings into our lives each day. So, we will take a look at the uh, qualities of Christian in relation to these uh, three parables uh, mentioned in Thursday lesson. Okay? So, um, this will be like a mixed qualities of those people mentioned in the parables of the ten virgins, the parables of ten talents, and also the parables of the sheep and the goats. What are these parables? So let me invite you to uh, get your Bible and open it with me to the book of Second Peter, chapter 3. Okay. Chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and gather lives as you look forward to the day of God and His speed, its coming. Verse 14. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. So what are the qualities mentioned in Second Peter chapter 3 while these Christians are waiting for the great day of God. These are the qualities that mentioned. You ought to live holy and godly lives. In verse 14, uh, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Okay? So, these are the qualities that really matters to Jesus for those who are waiting for His coming. And then, uh, turn your Bible to Second Peter chapter 1 beginning from verse 5. 
These are also the qualities that really matters to Jesus. And let us read and let the Bible speak for itself. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Number one, there is go uh, goodness. And to goodness, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. So again, Second uh, Peter chapter 3 applies to the parable of the ten uh, virgins. In the same way, Second Peter chapter 1 beginning from verse uh, 5 applies to the parable of the sheep and the goats and the parable of the ten talents. Okay, Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Uh, Peter said, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning, if we have these qualities we are actually increasing our knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So those people who really know uh, Jesus Christ, they have these qualities. Right? So let me uh, put it this way. If you have brotherly kindness, uh, this falls into the parable of the uh, sheep and goats, right? They minister to the needs of those people. Uh, refers to the sheep, okay? Uh, you really know the needs of these people at the same time. You really know them. Uh, you really know your Savior, okay? Uh, these are the qualities uh, based on New International Version of the Bible in here. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? This applies to the parable of the sheep and the goats, also the ten talents, okay, and uh, the ten uh, virgins. Another one is, and is in. Uh, Titus 2, beginning from verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to lead self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in here again, what are the qualities that mentioned here? Self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. These are the qualities that really matters to Jesus Christ. And these are the qualities that uh, mentioned in Thursday lesson. So... Uh, I think that's the summary of uh, Thursday lesson. Um, if we have these qualities, then we can say that uh, we are always ready uh, for Jesus Christ to return on this planet Earth. We are always ready for His second coming if we have these qualities. So, in our terms, let, it be, uh, let me put it this way. The parable of the sheep and the goats. Uh, uh, we have there an outreach program, right? Uh, feeding or helping the needy, okay, visiting, uh, outreach program. 
parable of the ten talents. Uh, we use the spiritual gifts that God has given us okay, to minister not only uh, through outreach but also in enriched ministry. We use our spiritual gifts uh, to edify the church as well as to minister to other people. Okay, The uh, parable of the ten uh, virgins uh, is more on preparation. Uh, it is mentioned in Second uh, Peter chapter 3. So these qualities, again, are the qualities that matter to Jesus Christ. Not only matter to Him, but also matter to us as a Christian because we are telling to the world if we claim that we are Christian. We are telling to the world that, hey, you know what? I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I have been changed. And uh, even though... Uh, I am only human, but praise the Lord because the Spirit dwells in me and I have this, not I have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit uh, can be seen in me. And these qualities, the qualities that really matter to Jesus Christ. So, maybe let's uh, read again uh, Galatians chapter 5. To see the fruit of the Holy Spirit there. That is not our fruit, okay? That is uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We don't have fruit of the Holy Spirit. That is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's take a look at chapter 5 of Galatians. Um, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? These qualities that uh, mentioned in Galatians and Titus and Second uh, Peter chapter 1 and chapter 3 is better than knowledge of doctrine. Okay? Knowledge of doctrine is important. Okay? But to practice that is, again, uh, another thing. It must go hand in hand. But if you have these things, these qualities uh, are the qualities that matter to Jesus Christ. Okay? As we prepare for the second coming. So... Again, may the fruit of the Holy Spirit be seen in us as we minister to uh, other people and also inside the church. Happy Sabbath and may God bless you all. To close our Sabbath school, please bow your heads with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the Sabbath day. Thank you for this day of rest. We thank you that you have taken care of us this past week. We thank you for this time that we get to study your word. We thank you for showing us how Jesus ministers, Lord. And as we look to him as our example, may you enable us and use us for your work. Guide us also. May you give us willing hearts and unselfish hearts also, Lord, so that we could do more for you and that you could do more through us. Um, May you soften the hearts of the people we will encounter. And may you give us opportunities, Lord, to reach out also. And at the end of the day, Lord, we pray that everyone will see Jesus through us. Um, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you're willing to use us in your work. And we give you all the glory and the praise. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We ask that you be with us as we continue with our Sabbath today. Uh, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.